Chris Darden. So I'd like to thank Swanica Corinthian Yacht Club, uh, the Swanica Winter Sailing Program, Laser District 8, for sponsoring this seminar. So I have my basic rules that are very simple. One, don't hit anyone or anything. Two, the rules are a shield, not a weapon. Three, always reread the rules for what they exactly say, not what you think they mean. So, as we've been doing for the last 12 years of this series, if you have a book that looks like this, you can now toss it in the fire. The new book for U.S. Sailing is blue. The changes this year are not very many. Quite a number of the changes are just changing things to how you already thought they were actually working. But that isn't exactly what the word said. So we've got some corrections on that. The layout of the book remains the same. All the definitions are in the front. The most important definition is room, because this concept is the fundamental and keeps repeating through the rest of the entire series of rules. So if you need room to avoid something, you're entitled to it. If you're looking to avoid a mark, you have it, but for a limited time and you have to act promptly, because room is a vanishing thing. <clears throat> if you wait too long and you're not the right-of-way boat, your room vanishes. Keeping clear is broken into two sections. The first is the basic keep clear of a right-of-way boat. The second part addresses that if a right-of-way boat, a leeward boat or a boat that's on starboard, can turn in both directions without immediately making contact with the keep clear boat, then the keep clear boat is keeping clear. So for example, Yellow, four, is the leeward right-of-way boat. Green is the keep clear boat. If yellow can turn up or turn down without making contact or getting too close to green, then she's kept clear. Yellow's on starboard, green's on port, they're allowed to adjust their course, and green has to keep clear. Any questions on that? Yes? In a sonar, can you cover what you think the distance actually is? So, here's an important concept that goes all the way through everything in this seminar. It depends. <laughs> so, if you're sailing in very light air, and you're just ghosting along, this space could get very close and you're keeping clear. If you're in much heavier wind conditions and the boats are getting bounced around a lot by going through the waves or gusts and the like, then keeping clear becomes a bit wider. So that way you're staying apart from each other. What would be a close pass port starboard in light air conditions. In heavier air conditions, the boat on starboard might want to avoid a lot earlier because you were too close for those conditions. So it can vary as you go around the course. I think that's the hardest thing about that room. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, it depends. Uh, proper course is another key definition. So proper course is the course you would sail to get around the course from the start to the finish in the shortest possible time. Your proper course going upwind is usually close haul. A close hold can vary between different classes of and types of boats. Going downwind, it can vary a lot because somebody wants to sail a little more 
off to a side as opposed to straight dead down. Again, it depends. But the proper course gets determined by the right-of-way boat. So yellow is right-of-way, they're the leeward boat. Green has to keep clear. If yellow decides that their proper course is to sail a little higher, green has to keep clear. A new definition that's in the rules this year is conflict of interest. And this is pretty expanded, and you'll want to reread it a few times. We used to have interested parties. So if you were an interested party, you couldn't sit on a protest committee. Um, in some cases, in some classes, you couldn't be on the race committee if your child was, or a relative, was out sailing because you could influence the results. Conflict of interest gathers all that together into one section now. And that if you have a conflict of interest because it's a friend who's in a protest that you're hearing, if your child is in a race that you're running, if it's someone who you have a financial relationship with, business for example, you should recuse yourself from that if the conflict of interest is such that it could influence you. Also new is support persons. Support person is anyone who's not on the boat, not out on the water, but supporting you when you're competing. This could be a parent who is taking a child to an event and then staying ashore. Um, as one person put it, it could get down to the caterer who's providing lunches for you. Sounds a little extreme, but their behavior and misbehavior specifically, you could be penalized for if it's that gross of misconduct. So not only does your entire crew need to know what the rules are, everybody who's helping you out has to know what the rules are. They can be individually penalized and possibly thrown out of the event for their misbehavior. And if it's deemed that their misbehavior or misconduct can affect your sailing, especially like, so for example, with the uh, Small Americas catamarans. One of the, t the cr support people put lead in the bows in order to go and get the boat to be a little more bow down and slightly faster. The people on the boat didn't know anything about it, but when it got found, they got the penalty because it helped them be faster. So you've got to make sure everybody knows we all have to follow the rules, everyone on the team, or the entire team get protested for. Where is that adjustment to the line? Where is that written, the adjustment to that? Uh, support person. It's a new definition. Okay. We and then you'll find it repeating in the rules over and over, especially through the protest section. So basic principles really haven't changed. Um, they address sportsmanship and compliance with the rules. That's the preamble. Our fundamental rules, we've got number one, helping people in danger and life-saving. If you can help somebody, you're expected to. If they're in the water, it's fundamental to go and help people who are in danger. Fair sailing, we're all expected to sail by the rules. And okay, for an example, if you're on port, and you yell starboard at somebody who you know doesn't know the rules very well in order to get them to attack away, okay. We don't really have a rule addressing that, but that's what fair sailing is for. But if you yell port, you're okay. Yes, if you yell port, it's just confusing, but you haven't actually tried to influence how they're sailing. Um, new in the rule is that it used to be if you were disqualified for fair violating fair sailing, it was a disqualification and you couldn't exclude this score. Now the protest committee can say, yeah, okay, you broke fair sailing, we're going to disqualify you, but it's, you could exclude this score. So it's 
gives the protest committee a little more range of what they can do. Fundamental Rule 3 is a complete rewrite. This says that you're going to comply with the rules, and as Dave Perry puts it, this basically forms a contract between competitors, the race committee, and the entire event as to how people are going to behave and how they're going to follow all the rules. And this ties back into binding the support personnel as well. Remember that the rules are not just the racing rules of sailing, they're equipment rules of sailing, class rules, national prescriptions, the NORs, the sailing instructions, notice of race, NOR, um, any of the assigned appendices or handouts for an event that are deemed as part of the rules. <clears throat> and you can be protested for breaking them. Rule four has remained the same. This is the decision to race. In the Fastnet race of 1979, 86 boats finished out of 303. Five boats sunk. 125 people were rescued. 15 sailors and three rescuers died, which is why we created this rule. It's your decision to race. You choose to go out there. It's all on you and your team to go and keep yourselves safe. And if you decide that you don't want to race, that's all up to you. Anti-doping has remained the same. And anti-doping refers to in performance enhancing drugs. Now for a lot of you, I'm going to save you a bunch of issues. Alcohol is not considered a performance enhancing drug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and there's an entire list of what the prescribed drugs are. Introduced in 2015 in the old book, which you had to hand write in, was anti-betting and anti-corruption. And this got put in deliberately ahead of the Olympics because there was so much betting going on on a lot of national events that people were actually changing how they were sailing in order to affect getting bribes for giving people advantages or ignoring things that their boat was not in compliance, um, changing standings as to who would win, who would lose in order to get a payout. Not so prevalent in sailing, very prevalent in cycling. And World Sailing decided, yeah, we need to get on this bandwagon with everyone else. New this year is Rule 7. And it formalizes the disciplinary code of word world sailing as now being part of our fundamental rules. And this deals with misconduct and the levels of misconduct and how it will be handled. So if you're an XYZ Yacht Club and they deem that you've had misconduct in the US, that has to be sent up to US sailing for review. In world sailing, they gauge it based on each nation, member national authority and how they want to do it, but eventually things can end up, end up being in World Sailing's notices. And if you go and look on the World Sailing website, you'll find there's a whole list of people who are banned from sailing, in some cases forever. Most of the cases, it's just for a number of years. But they've rewrote this and built it into the, prime, the uh, fundamental rules just so that everyone has the exact same script going around the world. So, part two of the racing rules of sailing is how we address how boats are going to interact with each other. So, for example, if we have a boat out sailing, and one that isn't sailing, the racing rules of sailing don't apply. International rules for, for the prevention of collisions at sea do apply, and that's written into the preamble of part two. So if this boat can talk this other boat into avoiding them so they can sail through, no problem. If this boat is a barge, tug, 
or other restricted vessel that's towing something, and you cut across in front of them that they have to take action, you're wrong and can be protested for it. So you have to be aware of the various vessels that are out there that are in the sailing area that we're in. One of the things you'll hear us talk about is the right-of-way boat. Well, there isn't a definition for right-of-way. The right-of-way is defined in the preamble of Part 2. That a boat has right-of-way over another boat when the other boat is required to keep clear. Now, we do have a definition of keep clear. So in this case, port has to keep clear of starboard and not interfere with how they're sailing. New in the preamble to part two is if a boat is racing and another boat isn't racing, so let's say we've got a finish line, yellow comes through, finishes, green's coming up, yellow turns down and interferes with a boat that's racing. Okay. Rule 24 addresses that they can be penalized for it even though they finished. If there's a boat racing in a different court, on a different leg, and you cause a collision that causes injury or serious damage, we'll go in time to whatever is the most closest in time race that you were in, and you get disqualified from that. <clears throat> So once you're finished racing, keep well clear of everybody. Just get away and don't interfere with anyone. Any questions on that? Yeah, what yes. do they cause, how far does that go? Does it, somebody's wind qualify as interfering? Does, yes. Okay. Yes, so, if you pull up over the finish line, and we see this a lot in diggies, mm -hmm. and now, these two people from this team are sitting there talking with their sails ragging. They're interfering with the boats that's still racing. They can be protested for it. By the person finishing. Mm -hmm. okay. Or the race committee. Though typically it's by another competitor. If you finish and you tack on to port and somebody's finishing on starboard, you're still the keep clear boat. You finished but you've got to get clear of the area. Basic rules remain the same. Port keeps clear of starboard. Windward keeps clear of leeward. Boat clear ahead and clear astern. The boat clear astern has to keep clear of the boat clear ahead. You're not allowed to run over this slow boat in front of you, no matter how much they deserve it. <laughs> when you are tacking, you are only tacking from when your bow crosses head to wind until you are on a close hauled course. During that particular point in time, you have to keep clear of another boat. If you have two boats that are tacking at the same time, the boat that's on the right has right of way if the two boats have a contact during the course of their tacking. Any questions on that? And that's irrespective if you're going from port to starboard versus starboard to port, correct? Same thing. Okay. Two boats tacking from port on to starboard. There's contact. He's the one who's right. He's the one who was supposed to keep clear. Sure. If you're right, you're right. Excuse me? If you're right, you're right. Yes. Right is right is the uh, shorthand way of remembering that. The rule says who's ever on the other boat's port side has to keep clear. Yes, Mary. Does this have anything to do with if your proper course is not close hauled? So in other words, if you're randomly no. parking and you're turning down, 
No, because we're only talking about just tacking. We're not at marks yet. Okay. We'll get there. Okay, limitations. Avoiding contact is rule 14. We're all supposed to avoid contact whenever possible. Going back to my first rule, don't hit anybody or anything. But the right-of-way boat doesn't have to anticipate that the keep clear boat is going to keep clear until they can see they're clearly not going to keep clear. And then they can take action. And if there's a collision but no damage, they'll be exonerated for the contact and it'll all be on the boat that, was, that failed to keep clear. If there is, again, damage or injury, this boat can be disqualified as well. If you alter course, suddenly turning up, for example, in such a way that the other boat that is the keep clear boat doesn't have time or room to keep clear, then it's against you. You were the one who was wrong because you altered course too fast. You have two boats sailing along. <coughs> Yellow tacks right in front of green. And now green, they've completed their tack, but green has to immediately alter course to avoid contact. Yellow tack too close. They gained right of way, but they gained it too close to the other boat, so the other boat had to avoid them. So then that protest would go against the now right of way boat, because they have to do it far enough apart when you get right of way that you can, other boats around you can keep clear. However, if you have right of way and the other boat so let's say green here has right of way. They come across yellow and tack. They've now given yellow right of way. Yellow is the lured boat. They turn down too much. Yellow doesn't have to do anything because they didn't gain right of way because of their own actions. It was given to them by the other boat's actions until it's clear that this boat is going to keep clear, then they can turn away and protest. One of the common moves we'll see going upwind, and this is called the slam dunk. Green comes across and tacks in order to slow up yellow. Yellow's reverse to that is while green is tacking and they're the keep clear boat, they turn up next to green. Green can't complete her tack because yellow is there and she has to stop and yellow can now get away. Any questions on that? I think you should mention the, the, the right of way boat. The boat comes right away and has to give the other boat the opportunity to keep clear yes. as well. Otherwise you both foul. So if yellow comes up really hard and fast, They've now broken rule 16. They've altered course in such a way to prevent this boat from keeping clear. Then it's going to go against possibly both of them. And yellows put themselves at risk by turning up so sharply. Another change in the rules is rule 21, exoneration. Exoneration used to only apply at marks and obstructions. So they moved it from part three, uh, from section B out to um, <coughs> D or C, I forget. But it's no longer in marks and obstructions. So it now applies all the way around the race course. So for example, we have a number of boats coming into a start. 
green three realizes he's going to be early and doesn't want to be. He pushes down into yellow. Well, clearly he's breaking a rule and he's breaking it quite intentionally. Yellow doesn't want contact. They get head down into blue. Blue is forced away or there's contact. Protest flags go up. Yellow can be exonerated because they were compelled to break the rule by greens breaking the rule initially. So now that applies all the way around the race course. If somebody forces you to break a rule, forces you to hit a mark or hit another boat, you can get exonerated in a protest for having broken that rule. But make sure you protest, because you really want to have a third party say, yeah, you're off the hook. <clears throat> Another fundamental basic is taking a penalty. Yellow comes up, hits the mark, they fouled, they've broken a rule. One turn, one tack, one jive, done in continuous motion, and now they're free to go sailing. Green fouls yellow, port starboard, yellow drives down, yells protest, puts up their flag. Green has to do two circles and then continue on. It's very important these circles have to be consistent. You have to sail clear of everyone else. So if you have a foul at the starting line, drive into a lured boat or whatever, you have to sa sail well clear of the other boats. Now that could just be letting your sails luff and stopping so you get clear. Or if you're in a pack and you're ahead, going up head to wind to let boats get around you. They're luffing this boat up, but that's just their misfortune. Um, but you have to sail clear of the other boats and then take your penalties. Is that a 720? Yes. Okay. We used to call it a 720, now we call it two turns. In that situation, how quickly do you have to, when you've got other boats around you? As soon as possible. How is that? How is it as soon as possible? It depends. <laughs> and time, it depends. So, if you're in the middle of a pack, like so, coming off a starting line, and their boat's behind you, as soon as you start taking your penalty, you're now a keep clear boat. So, you're stuck, but if you keep advancing, then you can get protested again because you didn't take your penalty in a timely manner. That's why it's a good idea if you're in a large crowd, stop sailing and let the, everyone get around you so you can get clear and take your penalty. Up at, say, a weather mark, you fouled, keep sailing and get yourself clear so you can take your penalty out where you won't interfere with anyone and then continue on. And you've got to uh, totally complete your penalty before you gain one more right? While you are taking your penalty, you're a keep clear boat. You are. However, <laughs> other boats can't interfere with you unless they are sailing a proper course. So, if you're in the middle of a co the course and you're taking a penalty and this boat comes and their proper course is to sail close hull and they see you going this way, they tack and you turn, okay, they were sailing a proper course so they're not really interfering with you. You have to pause 
your penalty, let them get by and finish it. So just because you've done one turn and you go to say, potentially start your second and then you have that approach in both, you have to be aware of that approach. You always have to be aware of everyone who's around you while you're taking a penalty because you're the key quitter. Yes. When you're on the starting line and you're over early, mm -hmm. you're rebounding the mark. Is that correct? So, green crosses ahead of the start. They have to sail back to the starting line and restart. Well, as soon as they turn back to restart, they're a keep clear boat. Yes. And it can be that they just sail over, round, and start behind whatever boats are there and continue on. Eric, unless the high flag is up, you can dip, right? Yes. So, dipping is greens over, but there's enough space below, and they can just turn down, get their entire boat below the starting line, and then start again. Yes, sir. Say you're three abreast. Three yep. boats, and, you, and you're in the middle boat, and you foul the leeward boat, and you have to take the penalty. If you have luffing rights on the windward boat, are you allowed to luff that windward boat up? Yes. So you can. Use so that the question was, if you're in a pack at the start, you fouled the leeward boat, but you have luffing rights on the windward boat. Yes, you can go up head to wind. In order to keep clear, you want to try not to progress. They get out of your way or attack away. Now you can go and take your penalty because you've gotten clear of the other boats. Do you have to warn them you're doing that? Do you have to say, I'm coming up or something? Because that's not no. normal behavior. No, you don't have to warn them, but it's a good idea to do so. Um, in team racing, we'll put up our hand and say spinning. And that gives everybody, including our teammates, the idea that, yeah, there's going to be a change in the game here, and this guy's accepting a penalty and continuing on. Can you go back to the uh, boat across this line ahead of the, um, ahead of the start? They're coming back, and you're saying you've got to give them right away to come back? No. I'm no. saying they are the keep clear boat. We'll go into that in a little bit in more detail as to uh, who's right and who's wrong going on there. Uh, protesting another boat. You have to inform the other boat at the first reasonable opportunity by hailing protest and conspicuously displaying a red flag. Now if the other boat is beyond hailing distance, you don't have to hail, but you do have to put up the red flag. If your boat is less than six meters long, 19 feet, 11 inches, no flag is required. New to protesting is, if a crew is in danger, injured, or there is serious damage, you do not have to hail protest and put up a flag immediately, but you do have to make that protest later and within the time limit for the event. The key thing here is serious damage and injury, which as I mentioned earlier, keeps repeating. It used to just be damage. Damage was kind of ill-defined. Serious damage is an impairment to the boat. Injury is injury to a crew. In Racing Rule 40, the life jacket rule, they've made a change. So if we go out here and at the flagpole, the Y flag is displayed. You have to wear a life jacket at all times while you are afloat. That means if you're not wearing it on the launch, you could be protested. So for you guys who are on race committee, may I strongly recommend that you do not display the Y flag ashore. You only display it from the race committee out on the water. Another thing that's a little different is that 
Here in the U.S., the definition of a life jacket and the requirements that U.S. sailing uses is for a 15.5 pound flotation. A lot of people are buying the Zik jackets and some of the other European jackets which are thinner, which are 50 Newton jackets, which are perfectly legal throughout Europe. They are missing about four and a half pounds of flotation. So they're not legal here in the U.S. Yes? Uh, when I was selling life jackets, what we were told was that if you're in an American regatta, you have to wear a life jacket that says U.S. Coast Guard approved. So that makes it very clear either they are or they aren't. Another thing that's been revised is Rule 55, which got introduced in the last uh, set of rules changes, which is intentionally disposing of trash into the water. It now applies at all times on the water, but you have to prove the intentional part. So sailing out to the race course and all the way back from the race course, you dump something over the side, you can be protested for it. Another new thing is we now have a defined technical committee who can protest you for breaking class rules, clothing restrictions, and life jackets. So that's a whole separate group now available to, uh, for the organizing authority to have to put together. So let's go to the starting area. Any questions on any of those items? Yes, Wick. To the uh, uh, race committee and sailing instructions allow the, the different life jackets, like the sick life jackets. I'd have to go back and look at the revisions to Rule 85, um, which says which rules you can change. Um, class rules clearly can. But I don't know if you can in the sailing instructions. You might be able to do it in the notice of race. And that's Rule 85 got rewritten in order to allow for what changes you can make to the sailing instructions and other restrictions and where you have to make them. So I would say probably in a notice of race, you could because people would know early enough ahead of the event that this is a change. But changing it in the sailing instructions when it gets handed out on the day you're there, they might not have had a chance to make that change and put them at a disadvantage. So I'd have to go back and look. And in practice, since 90% of us have either side jackets or gill race jackets that do not meet those requirements, is it really the seriousness of the regatta that we're dealing with that you're going to really focus on that? One of the things that a friend of mine likes to say is that every event has a particular scale. So a small weekend going out, we're just going to knock around the bay, sail around the buoys, beer can race, if you will. Yeah, people might not take that as seriously and might not get to that level of enforcement. At a world championship, clearly that's going to be the case. But it is still a rule. And unless it's written out that, hi, we're going to allow this, you can't allow it. Yes? Unless you don't move the tack. Yes. Let's say you come around the Leeward Bar, and you don't, you don't come around real quick, and you, you have two boats in a situation. Uh, the leeward boat is a boat length forward and one boat length to leeward, mm -hmm. and they tack. What is what, what is the room? What's so depending on the boat, and how much room and time do you have we'll to take the person? So two boats are sailing. And bring the yellow back a little. Okay, and and a length green forward, just a half. Of, yeah. So. Okay. Green tacks, they're now the right-of-way boat. But while they've been tacking, yellow's been advancing. So green doesn't become right-of-way until they have completed their tack. While green is tacking, yellow is still advancing. Right. At what point, at what point is not enough room? If it's here, if it's in the middle, so the half quarter, the boat. Again, it depends. <laughs> 
Yellow does not need to anticipate that Green's going to complete his tack. He doesn't have to take avoiding action until Green becomes the right-of-way boat. Because remember, while they're tacking, they're the keep clear boat. So Green now completes their tack. Yellow can either tack or duck. The question is going to be how immediate does it have to be? As a rule of thumb, I look to about three seconds because it takes three quarters of a second for a human to recognize a change in condition and react to it. That's the old dropping the ruler test and seeing how fast you can grab it. So this boat now pops up in front of them. One, two, okay, they had enough time to get out of the way. Boat pops up in front of him. Usually there is a large hail of an expletive. <laughs> <laughs> oh! And it's probably going to be a little too close. <laughs> so again, it depends. It depends on the conditions, the types of boats. A laser can tie much faster and keep clear much faster than, say, a 40-foot cruising boat. It all depends. <clears throat> okay. Let's go on to the starting area. So depending on the starting sequence depends on when the rules kick in. So prior to any signals being made, you're under the international uh, rules for prevention of collisions at sea. Everybody's got to keep clear of everybody else. Once they put up the warning signal at either five minutes for a five minute start or three minutes for a three minute start, that's just a warning. At four minutes or two minutes is the preparatory and now the rules are fully in effect. Before that, everybody needed to avoid everybody. Now, we're full on the rules, port starboard, windward, leeward, ahead of stern. Any questions on that before I go on further? Two would be one, for two minutes start, it's one. Minute 30. Minute 30. Minute 30. Yes. Okay. We wrote that for our two minute starts for winter sailing, we wrote that into the sailing instructions. So, if you're out sailing on the course and yellow establishes an overlap from clear astern on blue, they're not allowed to luff. They can only sail their proper course. But before the start, there can't be a proper course because you haven't started yet. So yellow can come from behind and luff up blue. Now, with that, there's still the restrictions of Rule 16, that they can't establish the overlap so close that the boat can't keep clear. If they establish the overlap and luff up, they have to do it giving the other boat sufficient time so they can keep clear. You'll have someone who's circling around at the start. They're on port. The other boat's on starboard. Starboard can't turn down suddenly into blue, where blue has no place to go. Yellow has to give them an out in order to keep clear. If they don't ex try to keep clear, then it can go on, the other, on blue because they didn't do anything to try to get away. Same thing over here, blue comes up below yellow. If yellow just sits there and does nothing to try to keep clear, then it'll be against yellow. At what time in the starting sequence? Before the start. Once the preparatory has sounded? Once the preparatory has started through the starting signal. So basically all through the pre-start, 
You want to not turn so fast that the other boat can't keep clear of you. And you want to be aware of the other boats and keep in mind how they establish an overlap with you because that will come in play once the start is up. Green is an obstruction to yellow and blue. Yellow and blue are windward or astern. They have to keep clear. If blue chooses to go below green, they have to give room to yellow to go through there as well. So, this isn't NASCAR. You can't go and scrape somebody off on the wall. Can you say why blue had to give room to yellow also? Okay. Because yellow was the windward boat. But this is an obstruction. Gotcha. <laughs> now, regularly you will see in a start that blue will duck down and yellow will go high. Well, that's just their choice. But if blue, yellow was trying to go down below green and blue failed to give him room, blue could be protested for it. Should yellow hail them with room? It's not a bad idea, okay. but it's not a requirement. So, we come up to the start. Green left up yellow and came from clear astern. The gun goes off. Green has to immediately turn down to their proper course. And yellow can then go on and go sailing. If green had come in from between these two boats, luffs up, luffs up, luffs up, the gun goes off, blue has no obligation to turn down because they didn't establish from clear astern. Green is stuck here, yellow's yelling at him, go down, go down, go down, protest. He gets exonerated because this boat wasn't required to go down and give both of them room. So it's lovely. But until this boat, which is the right-of-way boat, gives him room, he then has to take it as soon as it's available to him in order to get going. So that they know protest, that they know penalty? No. Because he's compelled to break the rule by a boat that's sailing within its proper course and within its rights as the right-of-way leeward boat. Anything that's attached to a mark deliberately is part of a mark. So if the race committee has a keep away buoy tied onto it, that's part of the mark and you have to avoid it in going around. Now with proper course, we'll take another version. Green sitting here. Blue comes up from below. And green has to luff up. Blue luffs up. The gun goes off. Blue is sailing its proper course. Because its proper course is to start and then bear off onto a close hold course. So green has to keep clear while they're doing that. And again, no protest because they are sailing their proper course. If you take away the other boat, and Blue's down here, his proper course is to luff up, sail around the mark, get on close hold, and get going. So you always have to keep track of how boats get overlapped with you all through the pre-start, and coming up to the start in order to know what their rights on and know where you are on a starting line so you can anticipate that somebody might be sailing their proper course and you'll have to keep clear. 
Okay. Rule 22 defines when you are completely toast. You are toast if you are over the line and you turn back to restart. And all these other boats, the rest of the world is coming at you. You are the keep clear. You've got to get out of the way. You are completely toast when you are taking a penalty turn. You're supposed to sail well clear. If other boats are sailing their proper course and you're in the way, you haven't kept clear and you can end up with yet another penalty. You come up to a starting line you realize you got there too soon. Oh my lord, what am I going to do? You push out your boom and you use your sail to push yourself back through the water. Everybody else who's sailing forward, you have to keep clear of. If you are now, and this is new this year, so Blue realizes he's gotten here and he wants to get himself a gap off of the uh, yellow and uh, green boat. This works in dinghies in certain high performance uh, boats. They pull up their center board, they push their boom out, and they crab to windward. Well, we didn't have something addressing that before, but now we do. So if you close up, and now this boat has no chance to get away, you're wrong. We had a way to address it before, but now it's formally addressed. If you back your sail and crab to windward, you're the one who's wrong. <coughs> if this boat can't keep clear. When you are toast, but you're completely protected, is rule 23. <laughs> If you're capsized with your masthead in the water, when you're aground, anchored, or rescuing somebody, you're protected. It's very important to pay attention to when some, especially when somebody's rescuing. Stay away, try to help them if you can, because that's fundamental rule one, but don't interfere with what they're trying to do. And yelling back and forth is a good idea. Any other questions in the starting area? Yes, Marian. Just to clarify, if you've gone over the line for whatever reason, gotten pushed, and you're, you start to turn around, and you're now prevented from completing the turn, yep. and there are boats, let's say, pushed green up closer, because suddenly they picked up speed. There's been a, you know, something. Are you an obstruction now if you just lock your sails? Because you have no... If you turn up... But let's say you can't get headway. You know, and you're at a dead stop. Are you now an obstruction or are you still fouling the world? You're both. <laughs> <laughs> you are fouling the world. You're a boat that has tried to come back because you maintain all your rights until you turn to come back. So if you go over the line early, you're hailed, and you don't hear the hail, and you proceed to sail all the way around the course, you have your rights all the way around the course. Other people will be yelling at you, hi, you were over early, but they still have to give you your rights. As soon as you turn to come back, now you become a restarter and you're toast. You've got to keep clear of everybody. If you turn up head to wind, fine. They go past you. You then turn and come back. If you're stuck in this position and boats have to avoid you, you can be protested for that. You'll have to take a spin as soon as you can, and then restart as well. Okay, but if you can get heads to wind, then you're an obstruction and they can't protest you? Because you're the boat clear ahead and you haven't turned to come back. The key thing is here, 
that until you turn to come back and restart. Well, what I'm saying is you turn and then you realize, oh, I can't make it. And then you turn back head to wind. No. no. Oh, okay. You already triggered the... Uh, okay. That, that was yeah. what I was asking. Okay, yeah. Once you turn to come back, anything else you do after that, you're probably going to have a problem. Yes, Vicki? The penalty, is that gauged by the infraction or the number of people protesting it? Like if three boats protested, <laughs> do you have one penalty because yes. you only did one thing wrong, or yes. is it three because yeah. you have three protests? It's all the same incident, and two turns will exonerate you on that. It's a concurrent sentence. Excuse me? A concurrent sentence. Yes, a concurrent sentence by legal advisor. <laughs> Could you quickly do barging while you're on the start line? Okay. Oh, yeah, that's good. So, barging. We don't get that much anymore. Though I will admit, a dear friend of mine, it was his favorite starting procedure. Barging is all these boats are close hauled, coming up to start, and this boat sticks itself in where it's not entitled to rights. Again, this isn't NASCAR. As much as you want to put green into the wall, you're not allowed to put green into the wall. So if red can, they have to give green room to go in so there isn't contact, and then protest them. If you have a number of boats that are up here luffing, green comes in, can red do anything? No. Therefore, she doesn't have to give room, because she can't and Green's going to end up buying a lot of fiberglass. And hitting the back of the race committee. And it's always fun having the race committee show up in the protest hearing. Any other questions on starting? Yes, sir. I think it's important to mention that, that the red boat, if there's room in there for three, and the red boat doesn't close that room down, three can go in there. You can okay. Room freely given. So, what Bam's pointing out, is that three's coming in and two realizes it too late and three's now overlapped on the committee boat. They can't turn up and do this because they've now altered course in such a way that this boat can't keep clear. This boat is still going to be wrong for going in there but now red is wrong too. Again, they can turn down, they can protest, but if Green had enough room to sail through and clear without Red's hard alteration of course, they may get away. Um, can Red uh, fail when he needs to give Green room? Yes. Okay. It's, it, it's yes. not required, but it's can really Red, a good idea. Can Red hail a blue boat? Yes. I need to yes, I need room to keep clear of this turkey who's coming in and taking room he's not entitled to. Right. Terribly sorry, but we have to not damage the toys. So, what would be would that be a DSQ then if they uh, did the protest for green? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions in starting? When, when is it legal for Green to come in there? When, when is it, when is it, only when there's enough room. Only when there's enough room. So if there's enough room that they were able to get the overlap and get through and get out without interfering with red, yes. yeah, room freely given. Can't be protested for that. You let him in there, he's your problem. Yes, John. Uh, you're, right. and you're not over early, but you tap it. You just have to do a circle. Uh, you just tap the pin? Yeah. Yeah, it's just like hitting any other mark of the course. Same thing with hitting the race committee, except there's normally people standing on it and they get a little annoyed. Um, but you tap either end of the line. Yes, it's just one circle. Just do a 360? Yes, one turn. Is supposed to vote contract considered two circles generally and just yes. an item on the course one? Like a it, or hitting a mark yeah. 
is one. Anything boat to boat is two. Okay. So let's go sailing up the course. Weather marks up here. Green's coming across on starboard. Red's on port. Red's to keep clear. Simple. No changes. Red's to windward of green. Again, keep clear. Red's clear astern. Again, keep clear. As we described before, tacking is from when you cross head to wind until you are on your close hauled course. Now that doesn't mean your sails have to be trimmed. The boat has to be on a close hauled course. Sails can follow later. The rules don't address the sails, they just address the course of the boat. There was one more on that pin end. Mm -hmm. you, you, you tap the pin and you immediately you know, come around and say you do a 270 and you head out on starboard. You don't do a full 360. You're restarting, is that okay? So you've hit the mark, yeah. you make the turn, oh, and then you head out on board. And you go this way? Yeah. Is that no. Okay? No. 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 You, still have to do you, you still have to. It's a tack and a jibe okay. in a continuous circle. So if you hit, go out, around, tack, and now sail off, you're fine. You're not what if you're OCS and you hit the mark? If you're OCS and hit the mark, you still have to take your penalty turn, get below the line, and start again. So, so Eric, Eric, if you hit the mark, you don't have to reround it. You just do your fair wet, correct? If you're not over early, on course oh, side, okay. OCS. Okay. So in Bam's description, red hits the mark and is over early. So let's say he hits the mark and he was on time. He just has to come out, do a circle, and sail on. He's over early. He has to come out, do his circle, and he can't. He's now down below the line, and then tack and restart. So he has to restart before he does the pirouette? He can do either. Oh, it doesn't matter which order you do it. But remember, your restriction on taking your penalty is as get sail clear and do it as soon as possible. So he hits as soon as possible can be out here. If he's right next to the mark, okay, so he's going to kill two birds with one stone, but he's got to complete and then take off. Okay. Yes. Yeah, question: If you have to do a, if you have to do a 360, a 720 as a penalty, can you do it between the two marks? I yes. Mean, you can. So yeah. you have enough time. You can go all the way up and then do your seven mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. You just have to sail clear as soon as possible. Okay. Going back to going sailing upwind. Again, avoid contact. As we said, tacking too close. If you tack right in front of another boat and they have to immediately avoid, it's on you. When you, <clears throat> two boats are sailing along, red on port is looking to cross green, green doesn't want that, he turns up slightly in order to convince red that they'd like to tack and go away. So long as they don't turn up in such a way that this boat has to take immediate avoiding action, they've done it slow enough and enough time so the other boat can keep clear, they're fine. Regularly you'll hear somebody say, I was sailing along, yeah he was crossing me, but then I caught a gust of wind and I turned up with the breeze and he was right there. It's on you. Wind doesn't matter. It's the direction of the boat. You turn the boat in such a way to prevent the other boat from keeping clear. The onus goes back on you, on green. So if you turn up earlier, early enough, that's okay. If you turn up early enough, hunting, so that the other boat has the opportunity to keep clear, then you're fine. 
<coughs> turn up, turn up. Okay, he now tacks. You can continue that way, though he now has luffing rights. Or you were just trying to guide him to that side of the course, and now you tack and go the other way. You're still fine. Okay. <clears throat> but in that situation, couldn't Green, and I've seen this, protest read that they had to alter course? Yes. So, another condition is looking at it from Red's side. Red thinks he's crossing. Green doesn't believe he is and has to duck to avoid or attack to avoid and they can protest the other boat. They kept clear of a boat that was required to keep clear of that. And so they can protest. And ISAF case 50 in the case book is, gives very clear direction on this, that this boat is responsible for its safety. And avoiding a boat that was supposed to keep clear really puts the onus on the boat that was supposed to keep clear in a port star. Um, you have a starboard, the green boat on starboard crossing ahead of the red. Mm -hmm. And then uh, same team racing, he wants to cover. So the green tacks to cover, and then the red immediately tacks and hits the stern. Oh, okay. So, what we've got here, let's say both boats are tacking. So green's tacking, and red's tacking and there's contact. Red's a stern, he's the one who had to keep clear. And that's written into Rule 13. If green's tacking and red luffs up and makes contact, they've altered course in such a way that the other boat couldn't keep clear. It goes back on red again. All right. Green sailing along. Red and yellow are sailing at him, both on port. Green is an obstruction to them. Yellow hails room to tack. At this point, red only has two choices. One, tack immediately. Or two, hail you tack and keep clear while yellow tacks. <coughs> the beginning of Rule 20 has a whole pile of restrictions of when yellow can't hail for room to tack. So, if this other boat's out over there, he hails for room to tack. Red, as I said before, only has two options. They can tack immediately or hail, you tack, and then keep clear. They can't say, that's too far away, you don't need to tack yet. Or, Another case is, there's a sandbar, shoreline, dock, yellow hails, room to tack, because he knows where the sandbar is, or he thinks he knows where the sandbar is. Red says, no, we can keep going. Sorry. If yellow starts to turn and then red doesn't do anything, they didn't tack immediately or hail a U tack, and they have to stop and let red go by and then tack. Red's going to have a very hard time in the protest room. You only have two choices in room to tack tack immediately or hail a U tack. I'm going to recommend you should always say U tack. Reason for that is that way it's clear indication that you're going to tack and keep clear, you're acknowledging that you heard their hail, and you're going to keep clear. When you're hailing for room to tack, you need to be, one, at or above close hold, 
and two, have enough time so you can hail it again. In case they didn't hear it because there's a lot of flapping sails and wind. But once they start to turn, you have to turn with them. So in the case <clears throat> of where we have the green obstruction here, yellow can't hail room to tack. He goes this way and then ducks him. Nope, you have room to tack. You just signed a contract that you're going to tack. This boat tacks immediately. Yellow can't say, well, I'm going to get a lot closer over here. Sail for a few more hull lengths and then go. They can get protested for that too. Another case when you've got two boats coming at each other, remember, Green's an obstruction because it's a right-of-way boat to the two key clear boats. Yellow decides they want to go below green. They have to give enough room to red to go below green as well. You can't scrape them off on the wall. Come around, everybody's clear, off you go. Any questions on obstructions? Sailing upwind. That last one you did is only when there's an overlap, correct? If there's no overlap, you don't have to give them Yeah, because okay. if there's no overlap, they're the keep clear boat to you. So, and you can have a, a room to tack like this. Yellow can't tack. They're clear ahead, but there's not enough room for them to tack and clear red. So they'd be hailing for room to tack. So that way they don't have a problem hitting green later. Yes? What, what does the committee do when one boat says, when there's a dispute on the facts? One boat says white, yellow, and black. How does the committee rule? Um, I'm going to give you a case that I heard a very long time ago where we had the two presentations from the two protesters. And I had to stop and I had to ask them, were you both sailing today in this harbor? Because one said they were sailing in six knots of wind, the other one said they were sailing in 13 knots of wind, and it took a while to figure out they were protesting each other for two different reasons. So it became very important to weed that down as to where they are. Yes, regularly you have that case where you're hearing a protest and you have to evaluate Who's got the more um, consistent story, the one that makes more physical sense and logical sense? And it's difficult. That's why we have very large training sessions before you become a judge in order to work out what are the commonalities, what do they both agree on? And then once you get where they all agree, you get that into a sequence, and you look to where they disagree, and then go from there. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> we're running a bit late here. So, at the weather mark, boats come in overlapped. The inside boat gets mark room. That's room to sail to the mark and to sail around the mark, the room that they need in coming around. And the other boats have to keep clear. And they come off the mark. As soon as they are no longer overlapped with the mark and or no longer need mark room, they no longer have mark room. So if you've got a boat that's sailing in, to the mark on port, this boat can't turn around so quickly as to prevent this other boat from keeping clear. They're clear of the mark. This boat gave them mark room that they were entitled to, but this boat can't alter course down into them. They have to keep. They are the right-of-way boat, but this boat has nowhere to go, so you can't close them out by slamming into them. <clears throat> Um, <coughs> yellow.
yellow comes in on port, packs inside of the zone, and now red has to sail up above close hold to avoid them. It goes back on yellow. They tacked inside the zone. They didn't have any protection. They won't get exonerated. If, now this is a change in the rules, if red comes in and we're now rounding the mark to starboard and tax and yellow has to sail above close hull, they had to sail above close hull. Because the way the rule got rewritten is that it's only when you're leaving the mark to port. So here, it's a change. If you've got a case where it's a starboard rounding, and this boat has to avoid, they had to avoid. Going back here, they were port starboard. Port still had to keep clear. Going to this side, port starboard is still on. Port still has to keep clear. So it doesn't matter whether, which way you're rounding a weather mark. It always stays the same. <laughs> Any questions on that? Coming into a mark, if yellow's up here, red gets in down here, red's claiming that they have inside and they're entitled to mark room. But they didn't have it back here. So the presumption is, if you didn't have it coming into the mark, you probably didn't get it. So the onus is going to be on red, that he may not get that mark room from yellow. If yellow has been sailing along, overlapped with red, they get to the zone, they turn up to break the overlap, get into the zone and turn down and they're claiming up oh, you're not entitled to room even though we were overlapped all this time coming up here it's going to be presumed that they didn't get break the overlap so it's very important as you're coming into a mark to look at what's your relationship with all the other boats and what the overlaps are question so where that overlap is established either before or after the zone if it was sort of a little bit of ongoing before you get there, then it's presumed to hold? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And as we said, if you hit the mark, get clear, it's a one-turn penalty. Two boats are coming into the mark. Green and yellow push down too hard. Red hits the mark. Red's been compelled to hit the mark by these other boats failing to keep clear. They can be exonerated in a protest and not have to uh, return, uh, take in a penalty term. <clears throat> I'm not necessarily sure I'd be the most confident of not doing the turn. Mm -hmm. Well, you can do you can take the turn as an insurance turn, but then you have to protest the other boats. Right. But don't you give up your rights when you do the turn? No. No, you do not. Taking a turn for any reason does not mean you're admitting guilt. So you're not forfeiting. Oh, okay. I thought no. you forfeited it when you do your three sixty. No. Okay, any other questions up at the weather mark? Okay, reaching and running. Two boats are coming down. Red it established from clear astern. They do not have luffing rights on yellow, but they are allowed to sail their proper course. So, if they see a puff of wind, that's coming down over here. If the other boat wasn't there, take it away, they would sail to that puff of wind in order to sail the course the fastest way possible. So they can 
tell, and I'd advise a little conversation. Hey, there's a puff of wind, I'm heading for it. So it isn't just immediately, hey, you don't have luffing rights, you can't take me up. I'm not, I'm sailing a proper course. Two boats sailing down. And there is a temporary trimaran in front of them. This is moving really slow. Would it make sense for Red to just go and arrow right into the back of all this? No. Their proper course may be to go to this side of it, the raft up, or sail down to the other side in order to keep in clear air. If they sail down to the other side, again, this is an obstruction. It's all boats that are clear ahead of them. They have to give room. I did make them all on port. That would be bad. We'll put them all on starboard so they're truly an obstruction. And you keep clear going that way. When you're sailing downwind, He's on starboard, he's on starboard, now his crew is holding the, the boom out to stop it from going over. He's now on port, because you're holding the boom out in order to force yourself onto that course. Your sail is starting to invert, so you're now considered to be on port. Can I ask a question? Yes. Before, the previous scenario, the boat's coming down on port and the boat's ahead of them, the trimaran one on starboard. Which trumps, the starboard or the overtaking? Starboard. Okay, so if those three boats were on... We all go to port. This is still an obstruction. We still have to keep clear of it. Okay, so that is the definer there. Yeah. So if I'm if we're all on the same... We're all on starboard. They're still clear ahead. They're still an obstruction. And so you have a proper course to try to get around it. Mm -hmm. on starboard, yep. I can basically do whatever I want to do if the other boat I'm overtaking is on port. Yes. If I'm overtaking and we're on the same port, port then... Clear ahead, clear astern. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if you've got a boat that's clear ahead of you on port, they're the keep clear boat. But, you can't alter course in such a way that they can't keep clear. So if you're sailing like this, and you overlap with them, and then turn down into them, you're going to be wrong because you turned in such a way they couldn't keep clear. But by and large, if I'm hailing that boat ahead of me on port, that I'm starboard, and they yell back overtaking, starboard trumps, I can yes. sail what I want to do, as long right. as I give them room to respond or whatever. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Because we're fleet racing, Right now, this boat is on starboard. His boom has now just crossed his center line. He's now on port. The sail doesn't need to fill. The boom just has to cross center line. He can flip it back, and now he's on a whole new jibe. So if he didn't have luffing rights before, now he does, because it's a new jibe. He went to port back to starboard, now he can turn and luff the other boat. <clears throat> so is that new? Nope. Same as always. It's just in match racing and team racing, there's a little more definition on how the sail has to fill, so you can't just have a flick flick and go hammer somebody. <clears throat> Any other questions on running downwind? Okay, let's get to the leeward mark. So we get within three hull lengths of the leeward mark. We have one boat on port, three boats on starboard. Who has right of way? Inside boat. Inside boat. Even though he's on port, he's inside at the mark. So he's entitled to mark room. We all have to keep clear of each other, but he's entitled to be on port, come down, and round 
the mark and sail off. You'll regularly see a whole bunch of boats coming down on starboard coming into a mark. As they come around and turn, the booms start flipping. You have to keep clear of that boom coming around because that's all part of their rounding and give them enough room so they can all come around. As you're rounding and tightening up, there was a small hole in the rules that you never knew about, which was this boat is lowered, this boat has to keep clear, but this boat has to give the other boat mark room. This has now been rewritten very subtly so that this boat has to give the middle boat room as well. It's the way we've always been doing it, but now it's been just rewritten so that it's all clear and comes around. As you're coming into the mark, everyone who's inside of you, you have to give room to. Green gets in, red is a quarter mile out over there, but he's inside overlap. He may not get there, but if something miraculous were to happen, and he did, Green still has to give him room to get in. He's outside, something goes wrong, he drops his spinnaker under the boat, Red catches up, he's got to give him room to round inside of the water. Any other questions on getting around the lower mark? Doesn't that four jack boat actually have to keep clear of the starboard jacket? Inside, outside, you're inside the zone. But the outside boat. He's the outside boat. He's the outside he's boat. Outside he's boat. He's on so he boat. has to keep clear. Okay. But let's say he's on starboard. No, no, no. He's still he, the he outside on, boat. If he was on port. He's on port. And that guy's on his starboard. Boat is on starboard, but he only gets the mark room. He has to come around and turn. He's not allowed to sail on starboard? No. Because uh, what catches you on that is, um, I think it's 18, 3 or 4, that you sail no further from the mark than you need to when you have to jive and jive as soon as possible to get around. Okay, any other questions going around the leeward mark? Let's go up to the finish. So at the finish, the finish line is very typically the start line, but it's not. These are now both marks of the course. They both have zones around them. So if red and green are coming in like so, red overstood, they're coming in, green can't put them into the back of the committee boat because it's a mark. This is the inside boat. They're entitled to mark room. Green has to give them room to come in and round the mark. Same thing on the other side. It's a mark. It has a zone. Red gets into the zone inside. Green has to give room and let uh, red go through. Two boats coming up to the finish line. Red hits the mark. They have to get clear, take their penalty, and then refinish. So if they come up, they hit the mark, turn around it, and try finishing this way, they didn't take their penalty. You have to complete your penalty before finishing. If you made a mistake sailing around the course and you missed rounding one of the marks, you can go back and correct it until you finish. As 
As soon as you finish, you can't go back and fix it. You miss sailed the course. You're always finishing from the course side of the line, and once you get through, you have finished when any part of the boat in normal position crosses that line. As soon as that happens, as we discussed earlier, get out of dodge. Get away from all the other boats that are racing so you're not interfering with them. Define normal position. So if I'm coming up with red and green or coming up like this, and one wants to shoot the line just to get their nose over, that's... That's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine because normal position meaning nothing extraneous on the boat beyond what it is. Right. So you're coming up to the finish line, and your boat is one of these sport boats with a bow screen. That you can extend. It's really close, it's really close. Watch the bow sprint. <laughs> Is that a normal position? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Okay. So that's important for race committees to pay attention to. With a downwind finish, you'll have people coming down and, let and they let the spinnaker go forward. <laughs> Is that normal? Yeah. Well, it depends how bad your crew is, but no, no, it's not normal. You're not allowed to do that. Um, any other questions?